Good evening, dear Mediascope viewers. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. This evening, we will have academic and journalist Kenan Sharp with us to talk about the changes in the arts and culture scene during the pandemic. But first, let's take a look at this week's coronavirus-related developments. As of May 21st, the death toll from the coronavirus in Turkey is 4,249. The number of confirmed cases has reached 153,548. A four-day curfew will be imposed in all 81 provinces from May 23rd to 26th during the Eid al-Fitr holiday, which celebrates the end of the holy fasting month of Ramadan. Following the weekly cabinet meeting, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan also announced that travel restrictions would be extended across 15 of Turkey's provinces for 15 days. Citizens younger than 20 will be able to leave their houses on May 20th and 22nd, Erdogan said adding that people over 65 years old will be exempt from the curfew on May 24th between 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. Erdogan further stated that schools would not reopen this academic year and education would continue in person in September. Erdogan also announced that mosques would begin being partially opened starting with Friday prayer services on May 29th. Health Minister Fahrettin Koca announced that senior citizens will be allowed to travel to their hometowns starting on May 21st. People above 65 need to get a special permission for their travel from the local governor's office, which will be given on the condition that senior citizens provide a fixed address for their hometowns and they stay there at least one month. Turkish Airlines' flight suspension due to the coronavirus has been extended into early to mid-June. According to the statement made by the airline on May 20th, domestic flights are now suspended until June 4 and international flights until June 10. Health Minister Koca announced that a mobile application will be used to track intercity travels. Citizens will use a code from the app to show that they're not sick or carrying the virus and be able to board planes and trains within Turkey. The app named Hayat Evesar, Life Fits Into the Home, has currently more than 10 million users. It includes a self-assessment tool for COVID-19 and shows risk maps of cities. Koja also said that the reproduction rate of the coronavirus has decreased below the critical threshold, dropping to 0.72. The value has reduced by half over the past week as it was 1.56 on May 13th. However, the number of coronavirus tests also decreased within this period. This evening, Kenan Sharp is with us. Kenan is a freelance journalist and academic based between Santa Cruz, California and Istanbul. He has a PhD in literature from the University of California. He's an editor and co-founder of Blindfield, a journal of critical inquiry, a columnist at Duvard English, and an assistant editor at Common Magazine. Hi, Kenan. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hi, Shirin. Thank you for having me. So, um, as a music lover and a cinephile, you have been observing and writing about how the pandemic has affected the arts and culture scenes here in Turkey. Um, you know, since everything has shut down, the entertainment menus have shut down as of March, uh, as of early March, uh, many content has had to move online. And I'm actually quite uh, amazed at uh, the rate uh, at which they have proliferated. How would you assess Turkey's arts and culture scene's reaction to the challenges of the global pandemic and uh, adapting their ad uh, ad events according to uh, the means at their disposal? I would say that I've also been impressed and I think people here have been really good at adapting to what is really an impossible situation. I mean, all, all over the world we've seen the example of these online concerts that are proliferating and people as big as the Rolling Stones, Lady Gaga, et cetera, have been doing this. And in Turkey, too, people are using platforms like Instagram, especially musicians, YouTube Live, Twitch, et cetera, uh, to perform and meet with fans um, through digital media. And often these people are teaming up with sponsors and able to make you know, an alternative source of funding through this. Companies like Red Bull here in Turkey, which is quite active, or beer companies, clothing brands, um, have all been involved in moving things online. And these are often quite enjoyable, you know, creating a sort of genuine atmosphere where the, the artists or the musicians chat with viewers, take request songs, you get to actually see their houses, which is interesting sometimes. Um, and we've also seen interesting things happen here in Turkey, like the country's first online music festival. Um, there's a, a festival called Fest Together, which began last year at uh, a major outdoor venue here in Istanbul. And this year, of course, with everything canceled and, and venues closed, like you said, um, they decided to do an all-day all live stream, and there was everything from panels with different NGOs, 
home yoga lessons, and then big name performers like the pianist Fazl Sai, the pop singer Serta Berner, more indie acts like Bukia, Bablukada, etc. Um, so in music, people have definitely adapted quite quickly, both the individual artists and corporations realizing there's money involved in this. Um, similarly, with, with film festivals, when the pandemic first broke out in Turkey, the International Film More Women's Film Festival decided to move their screenings online. And this was followed by the Queer Film Festival, the Workers Film Festival, Bashka Cinema, which shows independent films, and now the really high profile Istanbul Film Festival. And so it's a bit interesting watching this happen. We see people experimenting with different formats. Sometimes watching these films costs money. Sometimes um, these film festivals team up with larger companies or streaming platforms. And sometimes they're free, but they're only available for say 24 hours, 48 hours, things like that. So there's experimentation happening. Yeah. Um, same thing with museums and galleries from Istanbul Merdan mm -hmm. to smaller galleries. So I think people are doing you know, the best they can given the really difficult circumstances, finding a way to connect with fans and lovers. Um, companies are finding opportunities for advertising and artists and institutions are at least making some money as the process continues. Yeah. Um, well, as you mentioned, I mean, yes, there is quite a bit of uh, um, events uh, and platforms that have readapted uh, their content for the, the online platforms. But I still suppose that these sectors have nonetheless have been hit hard uh, with many creative workers losing their main source of income. So countries, for example, like Germany and France have created emergency funds for creative workers. Um, you have written in one of your articles for Gazette Duar that state support is essential for both the survival of individual artists and the health of the cultural sector as a whole. So in Turkey, what initiatives has the government started in order to support these creative workers? and institutions. I know the Istanbul Foundation uh, for Culture and Arts uh, released a report in late April where uh, they, they discussed the needs uh, of these sectors during the pandemic. Has this report been considered uh, by the government and their policies and their dialogues with the sector? Um, and also, do you think that the sector itself can get organized or are there more, do you see more individualistic efforts? Yeah, this is a really important issue. Um, it's definitely a difficult time for, for everyone in the creative sector, whether artists, venue owners, actors, directors, etc. Um, and my short answer would be that people are trying, but not enough is happening yet. Um, so for example, creative workers have, during the pandemic with everything closed down, lost the bulk of their income. And if we use the examples of musicians, we can see really how difficult the situation is. You know, individual musicians already often live month to month they try to piece together an income through multiple small sources. Um, music sales were already low. And if people are actually pressing records or CDs anyways, even fewer are sold now. Um, as for streaming revenue, you know, uh, platforms like Spotify, artists get already what is, you know, a few cents or a percentage of a cent per listen. Um, so you can see the situation is really quite difficult. There's the issue of merchandise, you know, people like selling things like band t-shirts or other kinds of things like that, which is not really well developed here in Turkey already. Um, and you see some attempts, you know, a lot of bands here in Turkey, for, for example, use websites like Bandcamp, where they both sell their music and also can sell merchandise. And some of these corporations have been waiving their percentage of the sales to try to support artists. But really, the bread and butter for musicians, again, to use that, that example, is live concerts. And if you think about the venues that have been shut, it's not just musicians. Um, themselves who are in a difficult situation. It's the roadies, the technical crew, the people who do light and sound, bouncers, bartenders, etc. All really rely um, on live music. So there clearly something needs to be done and there, there are attempts. So on March 17th, a group of um, recording artists, managers, venue owners, festival organizers met with representatives of Turkey's Ministry of Culture and Tourism and they asked for government financial relief for the music sector. Um, later in March, another group led by the musician uh, John Don Atchiton also urged the government to make musicians eligible for some of the economic shield package that's been declared. And these aren't unreasonable demands. I mean, like you mentioned, similar things have happened in other countries. In Ireland, in Ireland, 3,000 euros were set aside for individual artists applying for AIDS. The UK set aside 160 million pounds in emergency funds for artists and others. Um, so these kind of things can happen, but these demands haven't been yet met yet by the Turkish government. Um, there have been things like credit made available, short-term credit, 
the possibility of delaying certain tax payments for things like venues. Um, but what is really needed is, is large scale support, both for individual companies and institutions and also individuals. Um, you, you can think about individual workers, musicians, writers, illustrators, actors. These people are often working freelance, gig to gig, and are in desperate needs of funds. And these haven't come yet. So there are smaller efforts. For example, the mayor of Ankara, Mansur Yavash, um, has made musicians eligible for food and cash support as self-employed workers, which is, I think, how we should see these people as self-employed workers. Um, and there's been more ground up attempts at solidarity. For example, the Indian musician John Kazaz set up a, a crowdfunding campaign to try to support uh, the people who normally work with him when he's doing live concerts, whether roadies or sound and lights people. Um, so there's that model too of these, these crowdfunding sources, like there's companies like Patreon and Kickstarter, et cetera, um, donation campaigns like this. But in a time like this, when so many people are hard up, I think it's hard to convince people to donate, um, to donate money, especially if they're not getting content in return. Um, and surveys show that in Turkey, most people aren't willing to pay for online content anyways, which is a barrier to get past. So as for the question of how we support artists, you know, we can buy merchandise where it exists. We can donate on their Bandcamp, Spotify pages, things like that, buy digital copies of art or music, share art with others. But really, in this situation, nothing will, will replace government support, unemployment funds, and creative workers are in a precarious position. They don't have steady income. They don't have insurance through their employers. Um, so in that sense, when we think about artists, they really are precarious workers. They might not be as, you know, their education or class background might be different from other precarious workers who are working in the street right now, but they share something in common. And I think all these people really need robust support from the government. You're both an academic and a journalist, but you're also an avid fan of, of, the, of music and you're a cinephile. So I'd like to ask you, how has your online experience been? Yeah, it's, it's been interesting. I, I think personally, I've moved from, from a real excitement to a feeling of oversaturation, that there's just too much out there. Um, you know, when the process began, it was really quite exciting for films, for example, realizing that you can watch these wonderful film festival films from home is, is really a thrilling thing, sometimes for free, sometimes you may pay a small fee, but still, and you get access from, you know, the safety of your couch, or your living room, selections to films that are hard to access otherwise. Um, so that's been exciting, or some people have made um, films that were previously unavailable uh, free online for a limited amount of time. There's a wonderful documentary about the Turkish jazz singer Tulay Germán, and I've been I've been searching for months for this for years actually for a, a copy of this. So people have been making stuff like this available, and it's really an exciting time in that sense for me personally and for others. Um, but I think I entered this period of quarantine with grand dreams of self betterment and enculturation. You know, while you're confined at the house, you might as well watch and learn and, and see lots of things. But um, I think when everything moves online, you can sometimes lose the excitement. Um, at first, I felt, you know, a great thrill when I saw that an artist I love, for example, a musician, is on Spotify, uh, sorry, on Instagram giving a live concert, and I'd immediately watch and enjoy. Um, but now when everyone is live all the time, it's really hard to care. And I think the more content is available, the easier it becomes to consume nothing at all, mm -hmm. or to maybe turn back to older, more familiar, more satisfying films and movies albums from the past rather than searching for new content. So I think the, the feeling of oversaturation is a difficult one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people are gonna have to keep finding creative solutions if they're gonna keep, uh, keep fans involved and excited. Um, speaking of new content, um, historically speaking, at least some of the best works of art, certainly in cinema and in literature and even in music have been born out of crisis situations um, where the crisis itself has become the source of creativity and, and invention. And perhaps it's too soon to tell, but have you taken note of such bouts of creation in the last two months? Um, art that is particularly responding to this uh, moment? That's a great question. There's definitely a steady stream of new material being released. Um, and things are happening quite quickly. Um, but it's interesting seeing what artists are doing, how they're responding to this period. I'm seeing a sort of division between a couple different types of artists. Some are really intensely productive in this period and trying to respond as, as fast as possible to the situation on the ground. Um, for example, in that, in that online music festival I mentioned, Fest Together, um, the popular rapper Shanishar said that artists should have a lot to say during this period about what's happening in the world and that they should be you know, creating, creating new content really actively. 
Um, in other cases, we see you know, the popular rapper as how sort of disappearing and going silent. So I think some people are really motivated by this period and are producing a ton. Others are sort of disappearing. Um, but you're right that we see a lot of examples of great works produced during times of crisis. The classic example being medieval Italian writer Boccaccio's Decamerons, which, you know, of course, the setting for these stories is, is the plague and the Italian countryside and all these people are telling stories to each other. But I think we've yet to see the sort of masterpieces of the coronavirus era yet. I think, honestly, before we see any masterpieces, we're going to see a lot of terrible poetry and novels trying to capture the moment we're living through. Um, but one thing I've been tracking is how works that were maybe, you know, being produced before the outbreak of the virus, but are being released now, actually shed light on what's happening and what we're all living through. Um, one example I'm thinking of is um, the Turkish indie musician Milipek, who had been working for months on this album uh, called Mektupla, or Letters, and it came out at the end of April. And even though the songs were written and, and mostly recorded before the virus happened, um, something about the domestic setting, the way the speaker of the songs is thinking through past relationships really is evocative now in this period. Or other things like the, the high profile Netflix show, The Protector. Um, the third season came out right as the first cases of coronavirus were declared in Turkey. And in, in a sort of interesting coincidence, the topic of this third season is a contagious virus that is sort of causing chaos all over Istanbul. Um, so interesting things like this are happening, or for example, Orhan Pamuk's latest novel is about to come out, and it just happens to be about the plague in the Ottoman Empire, which again has intense resonance with everything that's happening in the world now. So I think we're going to have to wait a bit more before the, the masterpieces come, but it's great to see how reading and analyzing works like this in our own context really gives it new meaning. Um, lastly, Kenan, I'd like to ask you what type of cultural landscape do you expect once the pandemic is over? I mean, how will the, these new ways and online platforms be incorporated into the old ways of doing things? Again, uh, it might be too early to say anything, but do you have any preliminary thoughts regarding the future of arts and culture, particularly here in Turkey? Absolutely. It's a good question. I think, you know, sadly, by the time the pandemic's over, I think some people will have to have abandoned their creative careers and found other work, if there's any work to find. Um, but I think one thing the pandemic has really proven is how dependent we are all, how dependent we all are on culture. I mean, if there's anything that gets us through the uncertainty and the isolation, it's music, TV, film, shows, books, et cetera. Um, I think some things are going to shift, absolutely. Um, you know, certainly, as we've seen, art, certain art forms can be moved online with some ease. And I think some of these online formats will continue, like the live Instagram concerts, for example. Um, but despite that, I think there's a real hunger for meeting face to face that nothing else can quite satisfy. Um, there's been some interesting surveys here in Turkey, um, interviewing people who actively are involved in the arts as, as viewers or participants. And the, they found that the vast majority of concert goers uh, prefer online concerts and find it much more satisfying. In, comparing to, in comparison to online concerts. Um, at the same time, surveys show that most people, um, about 40%, 44% of people say that they're gonna wait, even if it's declared that the pandemic is over, they're gonna wait a long period before they return to places, crowded places like venues. Um, so I think it's gonna be quite a while um, before things return to some sort of semblance of normality. Um, but what we've seen, I think, is that people are really actively invested in you know, attending the concert in person, physically wandering through a museum, um, watching a film shoulder to shoulder with other people. And as much as I think some of these online things will continue, nothing can quite replace this. Um, but really, if there's going to be a cultural sector to return to, once this is all over, we're going to have to see the people who produce the art we love really getting some support. Yes, I think that's, that's one of the, the key issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, immediately, actually, before more time goes by and before, um, you know, people are, you know, in a more difficult situation that they already are in. Yeah. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Kenan, for, for joining us and for painting a picture of the, uh, the current situation in the arts and culture scene in Istanbul, in Istanbul and Turkey in general. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure talking with you. Chief of Staff of the Turkish Navy, Rear Admiral Jihad Yaycı, resigned on May 18th, two days after being demoted by President Erdogan. In his resignation letter, Yaycı said that his honor was hurt as a result of the hasty demotion that took place over baseless reasons reminiscent of Gülen-like conspiracies. 
it's clear that I can't continue my duty as a rear admiral who was dismissed as a result of lies and slander via a plot, Yaija said in the letter. Yaija said that he could fulfill all types of duties, but the situation is different this time. I'm being tried to be put in a position of an admiral whose honor is hurt. It's impossible for me to accept that. My character and Turkishness pride won't allow it, he said. According to daily Hürriyet columnist Nedim Şener, Yaycı has been the target of Gülenist in the army, adding that his demotion was secured with false claims of tender rigging. Yaycı has been reputed as the architect of Turkey's Libya policy, as well as a vocal advocate of the Blue Homeland concept, a political military agenda that suggests Turkey has to aggressively protect its maritime borders in the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea and the East Mediterranean at all costs and by all means. Yaycı has also occupied a special place in the Turkish government's fight against the Gülenist network, which is accused of orchestrating the failed coup attempt in 2016. The algorithm used to point to alleged Gülenists in the Navy ranks has been his trademark. Attorneys of business person and rights defender Osman Kavala have submitted a petition to the public prosecutor of Istanbul and requested the release of their client. Kavala's attorneys have demanded that the court consider the finalized ruling of right violation and immediate release of the European Court of Human Rights as of May 12th. In the petition submitted by lawyers Köksal Bayraktar, Deniz Tolga Aytöre and İlkan Koyuncu, it has also been noted that COVID-19 cases have been diagnosed in Silivri prison, which will put Kavala's health at risk. On December 10, 2019, European Court of Human Rights gave a verdict of right violation for Kavala, who was detained on October 18, 2017 and arrested on November 1st. The European Court of Human Rights concluded that the European Convention on Human Rights was violated on the grounds that Kavala was arrested without any reasonable suspicion and with political motives and that the Constitutional Court did not examine his application within a reasonable period of time. The court ruled that Kavala should be released from prison immediately. With the rejection of the government's request for the referral of the case to the Grand Chamber, the verdict has become finalized as of May 12th. The petition filed by the attorneys stresses that the state parties are obligated to comply with the European Court of Human Rights verdicts, citing examples from the previous verdicts of the Supreme Court pertaining to the same matter. Greenpeace has announced that the amount of plastic waste imported by Turkey from the European Union countries has increased by 173 times since 2004. As China has banned plastic waste import in 2018, Turkey has become a new destination for plastic waste. Greenpeace Mediterranean referred to the recent data shared by the Eurostat, the statistical office of the EU. According to this data, Turkey ranks first in plastic waste import from Europe. Of 14 million tons of waste imported from EU countries in 2019, 582,296 were plastics. Furthermore, in the year 2019, when plastic waste imports hit a record high, the monthly average plastic waste import increased to 48.5 tons. It was mainly caused by waste coming from the UK, Italy, Belgium, Germany and France. Turkey's plastic waste imports increased by 173 times from 2004 to 2019, meaning 213 truckloads of plastic waste is being dumped in Turkey per day. Commenting on the issue, Nihan Temiz Akkaş, the plastic project director of Greenpeace Mediterranean, has underlined that Turkey should avoid paving the way for greater environmental problems by importing plastic waste from other countries, as it cannot deal with its own waste. Turkey is a country that cannot cope with its own waste. We cannot be a zero-waste country by importing plastic waste from other countries. An uncontrolled plastic waste import will do nothing but aggravate the existing problems in Turkey's own recycling system. The risk of plastic waste to transmit the virus has also become an issue during the coronavirus outbreak. We demand that the Ministry of Environment and Urbanization ban plastic waste import and introduce mechanisms of transparency and inspection to the waste recycling. Don't let Turkey become a plastic waste dump. That's all from this week in Turkey. See you next Friday at 8 p.m. Good night.